See, at least when you laugh after you fuck her, it is not rape, but you guys are in a club and let me hear this shit. Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel and I'm going to just jump straight into this video because there's so much ground to cover you have no idea. I have basically gone down a deep dive rabbit hole about Manson and his past ever since I made my video about his relationship with Evan Rachel Wood and the toxic abusive stories that she has shared online about her ex-partner who I, in that video, speculated to be Manson, and a lot of people speculate to be Manson, but of course, she never fully named him, and a lot of people have never fully named him, so it's very, very hard to say for a fact that this is who this person is that they're speaking about, but I do feel like there is evidence, and that's why I made that video. But some people were obviously not completely swayed by that, and they're like, oh, how can you say that? Like, you've no major proof that he's, like, an abusive person. And I thought, okay, that's a fair point. Like, you know, we can't fully know the ins and outs of anyone's private relationship. But I did a bit of digging online afterwards and there's so much information given by Manson himself, especially, that proves that he is an abusive person. He's a toxic person to be around and a lot of people have alluded to that fact. So I wanted to share that in this video because a lot of the information I'm about to share in this video comes from Manson himself, which I feel like says a lot. Like, if you're openly telling people, hey, I do these things, I mean, people should really listen. I want to be clear that this is very disturbing. I mean, a lot of this stuff that I'm about to show you guys is really disturbing. It's not an easy thing to read about or watch, so I'm just giving you guys a warning now because even when I was researching this video, I had to take breaks for like a day or two at a time while researching it because it was just very disturbing and sad and just so upsetting. So please be aware that there will be a lot of horrifying imagery and information shared in this video. I would absolutely encourage you guys to do your own research. If you just Google some of the things I mentioned in this video, you will find more information. You'll find different threads and leads that will just send you down this crazy rabbit hole that I went down because the amount of information is astounding. And that's why I wanted to compile as much as possible into this video, just to show you guys the severity of the situation. And I know a lot of people are going to say, oh, he's a rock star. It's his persona. Like, that's what he does. I think, yeah, you can have a rock star persona and you can portray this like, you know, bad guy or whatever, but to actually be like that all the time in real life and then boast about it in your interviews and get away with it is not okay with me. I'm sorry, that doesn't, that doesn't sway me. I don't, I'm not convinced by this like rock star persona that you have to act like an ass. You really don't. So without further ado, I'm going to give you guys as much information as possible, but again, be forewarned, this is disturbing. This is an excerpt from The Long Hard Road Out of Hell, the 1998 autobiography by Marilyn Manson. In my room, along with my kiss posters, hand-drawn cartoons and rock albums, I also had a collection of glass Avon cologne bottles that my grandmother had given me. Each was shaped like a different car, and I think it was the Excalibur that sent my mother to the hospital one night. She had come home late and wouldn't tell me where she'd been. Suspected of her cheating, I lost my temper my father had handed down to me, and I threw the bottle at her face, opening up a bloody gash above her lip and scattering cheap perfume and shards of blue glass across my floor. She still has a scar, which has served her as a constant reminder never to have another child. In altercations that followed, I hit her, spit on her, and tried to choke her. She never retaliated. She just cried, and I never felt sorry for her. This next tidbit of information is Manson detailing how he got a kick out of verbally abusing and upsetting and physically abusing an employee of his, his ex-assistant, whose name is Jonathan. And the thing about this that I wanted to mention is that he kind of attributes his abuse of this person to making this person stronger in the end. It's almost as if, like, because Manson abused him, he made this guy tough and more masculine. And he's almost kind of gloating about it, which is just so unnerving to me. Even hearing about how he treated his mother previously in the last clip that I shared with you guys says it all. If someone can treat their mother like that and their employees like this, 
it's all downhill from there, in my opinion. Everybody's reaction is that it's a self-portrait, but it's actually a friend of mine who used to be my assistant. His name is Jonathan. He was a really weak-willed kid who was probably 18 when I met him, and I put him through hell. He had to wash paint out of the crack of my ass and clean up my vomit. At one point, when he was working with me, he would get really mad because I would have physical altercations with him when I was coming off stage sometimes. I told him I would pay him $100 if I ever hit him unintentionally, and then I got drunk one time and laid $500 on the table and beat the shit out of him. Now he's more of a masculine, intelligent, and great friend of mine. I took a photograph of him, and the way I lit it with just one bulb overhead met his face shadowed like that. He looked like a really mean person. An ex-girlfriend of mine gave him the label, the enabler, because anytime you go through any kind of rehabilitation program, you're supposed to get rid of the person who enables you with the unhealthy elements. So that's kind of the joke behind the title. That piece is one of my favorites. I swear, your honor, I do not drink alcohol, I do not take narcotics. See, at least when you laugh after you fuck her, it is not rape, but you guys aren't in the club and let me hear this shit. Perhaps one of the most famous and publicly detailed relationships Manson has ever had was with his ex wife, Dita Von Teese. Dita Von Teese was a burlesque dancer who married Manson in 2005 after a five year long relationship. However, a year later, Dita filed for a divorce in 2006. In an interview with Harper's Bazaar in 2007, Dita said she did not want to air out her dirty laundry about her relationship, but she did allude to leaving due to something unacceptable happening. The article reads, This much is clear. Something happened. Something catastrophic enough to have her call a moving truck the day before Christmas, move into a rental home, and book a flight out to Idaho the following morning to spend the holiday with her family. Let's just say that it must have been something pretty bad for me to move out of the house after six years together and to pack up my stuff on Christmas Eve, she says. I loved him and this was the most painful thing that I ever had to go through. It's been really difficult. It's not what I expected when I got married and I felt like I'd found the man of my dreams. But sometimes things change overnight and you have to make a choice whether you're going to respect yourself and say, I'm not going to accept this. This is not okay. I'm not the first woman or the last to go through what I'm going through. I just keep reminding myself of that. In another interview about her divorce, Dita often alludes to possible cheating allegations and also worrying signs of abusive behavior. This interview states, A week before she left, Dita had started to look for a new home. She says she heard some revelations. She continues, I thought, wow, I've got to get out of here. Women's intuition is a real thing. Then suddenly you have to see the facts. Then I decided and thought, well, you know, I've taken a lot of abuse. It wasn't always easy, but this time I'm asking myself, how much more am I going to take? She then goes on to say, I don't regret my divorce from Marilyn Manson. It was the right thing to do. He and I are birds of a feather in many ways. I have really fond memories of the first half of our seven-year relationship. It was this romantic artist muse time and he made the record The Golden Age of Grotesque, inspired by my world. But then the other half got pretty dark. I've got to ask you, because mm -hmm. you, you were married uh, to Marilyn Manson. I was. Singer, mm -hmm. entertainer. And uh, you, are, are you now divorced? No, not officially. We're still going through the divorce process, which, yeah. Has, has this been tough, difficult? Period? Uh, yeah, it was a, a great shock. I, I um, you know, back in, I left my, I, my home that we lived in for seven years. I, I left on Christmas Eve. Uh, you know, things came, became apparent to me 
<laughs> and suddenly I packed, found myself packing up everything I owned and leaving with, um, with just my clothes and my shoes and I'm my sorry. pets. And, um, but you know, it's like, I'm not the first woman who's, who's gone through these kind of things or had heartbreak. I'm not the first person to deal with heartbreak and, and things not working out the way that you expected them to, but life goes on and, you know. I, I, I don't want to beleaguer it, but you, you've cited, uh, you're an, Irreconcilable. Yeah, well, because you know you have differences. You have in, three in choices when you have when you're filling out that paperwork in California. You don't get to write why you're leaving. You get um, to say either it's the marriage is annulled, or you get to say that they're mentally ill, which you know was tempting. But and then the third option is irreconcilable differences, and you don't really get a choice. That you know. Irreconcilable. Yep. They they come up with that term so because it's broad. It, it counts for it's, everything. It's the middle ground, and yes. and and I understand, and I'll, and I'll drop it at this point. And I understand that that he's actually been dating somebody who looks like you, and is <laughs> she's nine, given, nineteen. She's or had 20. a makeover, I believe. The new girlfriend that they're referring to at the end of this interview is Evan Rachel Wood, who is said to have met Manson around the time that he was still with D. Avantis, and Evan was supposed to be around eighteen or nineteen when she first met Manson. And as you can tell, they're, they're kind of making fun of the fact that now Evan looks kind of gothic. She looks kind of pin -up -y. She's dressing like Dita. And this is something that I came across on several social media platforms. One that I really want to mention right now as a massive source for this video is Manson is Abusive, which is an Instagram page that chronicles a lot of this. And this is where I found a quote on their page that I thought I would mention in this video because I feel like it's very, very poignant. Evan Rachel Wood is quoted as saying, There was a certain way he wanted me to look, otherwise I would endure name-calling and ridicule. Another ex, Jordan Arendt, said that he has an obsession with appearance and would often try to change girls he was with so they'd look better by his side, telling them to dye their hair a different colour, to stop tanning so they'd appear paler, to never wear pants because they aren't feminine enough. I'm just going to put some pictures on the screen of Evan Rachel Wood right now, and I bet you can guess around the time she was dating Manson, you can see a massive shift in the way that she dressed. And you can also see here one of his girlfriends, Lindsay Usich. I'm probably saying that wrong, but this is a girl that he kind of on and off dates, and you can see where her style changed when she got with Manson. And also Isani Griffith, you can see her style shifting to the more gothic, Dita, pin -up -y style. So I would believe that this is probably quite true. And I would say that Marlon probably prefers his girlfriends to be more aesthetically pleasing alongside him and kind of emulate his look somewhat. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is something he pressured the girls to do, or perhaps they started to do subconsciously because they felt pressure in a way. I'm not sure, but I just thought this was a very, very interesting point to make. If you would like to see a more in-depth video about the relationship between Manson and Evan, I'll leave a link down below to my first video documentary that I made, where it's basically focused on their relationship and there's so much to it that I dedicate a full video. And then I got, you know, sent down the rabbit hole and discovered all these consistencies between his previous relationships because a lot of this stuff seems to link up and you can connect the dots yourself, like it's hard to like not see them when they're directly in front of your face and these women are all sharing similar stories. One thing that I did want to mention before I move on is that Lindsay seemed to have confirmed on her Instagram page that she was dating Manson around the tail end of his relationship with Evan. So he was cheating on Evan. Big shock, I know. <laughs> Probably the least shocking thing in this video is his serial cheating. But one thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is something that I came across through several different posts and testimonies from ex-girlfriends of his, is that he seems to use sleep deprivation as a way and a means to manipulate women into being submissive and doing what he wants. And this is a consistent story that many women have told. Some of them mention a room that he would lock them in. And Manson himself mentions this in interviews. In an interview with Nylon Magazine, Evan Rachel Wood spoke about her abuser and said, If I tried to sleep, he would throw things at me or instruct me to do drugs, which would disorientate me and keep me awake, sometimes for days. Once I was weakened by no sleep and little food, he would sometimes force me to partake in acts of fear, 
pain, torture, and humiliation, which he would videotape, and which I felt powerless to stop. Furthermore, another famous actress by the name of Esme Bianco is also an ex-girlfriend of Manson's, and has testified for the Phoenix Act. In this next clip, you can hear her speak about similar situations to what Evan Rachel Wood has went through with her ex-partner. And also, I find it interesting that the two often interact on social media and speak about very similar experiences. Good morning, members of the committee. My name is Esme Biancoma. I'm a domestic violence survivor and advocate. Before he succeeded in his seduction, my abuser carefully groomed me, manipulating and gaslighting me over a number of years of friendship. He knew that I was easy prey. I had neither power nor control over my life. A previous intimate relationship had stripped me of both, and so I was led from the frying pan into the fire. Initially, he was charming, intelligent, funny. He told me I was his soulmate. By the time I was living with him, he controlled every aspect of my life. He had a dress code I was expected to abide by. He controlled what I ate, decided if my friendships were acceptable, and when I called my family, I did, I did so hiding inside a closet. I was not allowed to key to the house, and I would often be locked in the bedroom. He controlled when and if I slept, and I was often violently shaken awake should I go to sleep without permission. Verbal abuse and name-calling was a daily occurrence, but the physical violence was most often disguised in acts of intimacy and was not consented to. In one instance, I was bitten until my body was covered in bruises, on another occasion cut with a knife during sex. He took photos of my naked, mutilated body and posted them online without my knowledge. I still have these photos along with photos of my body covered in welts and inflicted with a whip. On one occasion, after four days of no sleep, he became very angry with me. He started smashing holes in the walls with an axe, and as I tried to calm him down, he began to chase after me with a weapon. It was at this stage I realized my life was in danger. I was a prisoner in his hell, and yet I thought I had done something to deserve this, so I just tried harder to please him. My trauma had normalized these horrific events to enable me to survive. It took me seven years to get to the stage where I could see these acts for what they were, domestic violence. After a diagnosis of PTSD, the symptoms of which I still suffer on a daily basis, I started the incredibly painful process of healing from my trauma. The night terrors are the worst part. I wake from these dreams screaming, soaked in sweat, sweat mid-panic attack, and once the panic subsides, it is replaced with a crippling shame. The shame is overwhelming. The fear that I might somehow repeat past patterns and find myself back in the cycle. When I finally found the courage seven years later to seek legal advice, I was told, despite having photographic, video, and written evidence, that it was too late. Nothing could be done. So I live. So I live with the daily knowledge that my abuser is still inflicting irreparable damage on other women. The Phoenix Act gives survivors the time they need to break the cycle for both themselves and their abusers, who we know are statistically most likely to continue abusing if left unchecked. I know I will never see justice for what happened to me, but I am here risking my safety and that of my family to respectfully ask you to vote yes on this bill and give thousands of survivors a chance to seek the justice they deserve. Thank you. I'm going to share with you guys an Instagram post that Esme posted a while ago that really is irrefutable evidence, in my opinion, that the abuser she is speaking about is Manson. I also want to take this opportunity to give you a brief trigger warning because I will be showing an image that is very disturbing and upsetting. In the image I just had on screen a second ago as I was speaking, you can see that Esme Bianco is with Manson and she's wearing a pink dress. And this was taken on her birthday. And in this Instagram post, you can see that she's wearing the exact same outfit. It is on the same night. She's wearing the pink dress and she is speaking about her abuser. The next picture I show you guys is going to be graphic. But Esme's Instagram post reads as follows. This is my back. The injuries you see are real. The whipping that gave me these wounds was filmed in the name of art. I used to look at this photo with pride because I thought it was a sign of great devotion to my abuser. Now I look at it with horror. Despite the many years that have passed since this happened, my night terrors and PTSD symptoms continue to get worse. I am a domestic violence survivor and I am not okay. This photo was taken on my birthday many years ago. The night before, I had just been locked in a bedroom alone and not slept. I was surviving on very little food and was physically and mentally exhausted. 
I often wasn't allowed to sleep. In this photo, my boyfriend is giving me my birthday present. Despite the plastered on smile, I can see the emptiness and the fear in my eyes. We went for dinner later and he spent the whole evening berating me because I didn't want to go out. I was not okay then and I am not okay now. Esme has become very vocal on her social media about the trauma that she has suffered from the abuse of her past relationship. She even mentions that because of the abuse, she now suffers PTSD and anxiety and depression. And here you can see some of the medication that she has to take due to that. And she also goes on to mention on her social media about BDSM, which I feel is something that I really want to mention very quickly because people are going to try and say, oh, they were in a BDSM relationship and it was consensual and now she's trying to take it back. And I really don't believe that. I really do not believe that that is true. I mean, you saw the pictures there. I don't think she would share this picture with such animosity if it was consensual. And one of the things that she mentions in this tweet is BDSM is consensual. BDSM has a code of conduct. BDSM uses safe words and BDSM is enjoyable for everybody participating. Abuse is not. I have been abused under the pretense of BDSM multiple times and it was none of these things. Furthermore, in this tweet, you can see that Esme mentions sleep deprivation, and you may remember this from my first video when Evan Rachel would also mention sleep deprivation as a common tactic that her abuser would use to control her. Esme says, sleep deprivation is by far one of the most damaging elements of the domestic abuse I suffered. My abuser would keep me awake for days on end, making it far easier to coerce and control me. It took me years to re-establish a cardiac rhythm and being tired is still a PTSD trigger. An interesting reply from another ex-girlfriend of Manson's was from Ashley Lindsay Morgan, who dated Manson around the era of 2010 to 2012. She replied to one of Esme's posts and said, Being held captive in that liquor store dungeon was the worst. I thought that if I could just be good, less sleep, less everything. I'd someday be free. Why did we all seem so much like we needed to be hurt? Why was I so willing to let him punish me? I'm still not okay. Between the absinthe and piles of cocaine, I thought I'd never escape being his Alabama. I wasn't okay then. I'm still not okay. When he had me captive in the stupid ballet studio, I cringed hearing him brag about replaying the scene from Rules of Attraction to you. I thought no one would ever talk about this. One of the craziest things about all of this is that a lot of it is backed up by Manson. I mean, he mentions these things in interviews in such a boastful manner, I can't believe that he hasn't been called out sooner. You can see here in an interview titled, A Life in the Day, The American Shock Rocker Marilyn Manson. I don't like staying in bed too late, so I'm usually up about three in the afternoon. If I locked my girlfriend in the naughty room the night before, I have to remember to let her out or she gets mad at me. Then I brush my hair and smear my lipstick across my face and put on my sunglasses. Here is another interview where Manson boasts about his ballet sex dungeon. And I just can't believe how many times this man literally incriminates himself. Manson refers to the former dance studio as a place to sleep and have sex in, which has a small room that if anyone's bad, I can lock them in and it's soundproof. It's called the bad girl room, he says adding that the room is often used. In plain English here, Manson is telling us that he has a room that he locks women in. I mean, this man has said this in several interviews, boastfully, as if it's some sort of crazy rock star thing to do. No, it's what an abuser does. I very briefly want to show you guys an image here of Manson's current girlfriend, whose name is Lindsay Usic. I'm sorry if I'm saying her name wrong, but you can see here that he has taken a photograph of her, as he usually does with his girlfriends, of her with a black eye. So I'm not sure if this is something Manson has inflicted on her or not, but either way, a very disturbing image. And you can see here that he commented on one of her Instagram posts with the word pig, which doesn't seem very romantic, but... The reason why I wanted to show you guys Lindsay is this seems like the patterns are still continuing and Lindsay is very enamored with Manson. It seems like she's still in a trance. She's in the thick of it right now. So who knows what's going to come out when Lindsay and Manson eventually, potentially, inevitably break up. But I just wanted to show you guys that this stuff is still continuing. 
I want to give another trigger warning for this section of the video because I feel like this part of my video is going to include the most disturbing content visually and audibly. You're going to hear and see some things that are very, very harrowing and awful and I just feel like I needed to tell you guys that you need to be prepared for this because it's not nice but I really felt like I had to include this in the video for you guys to understand the severity of the situation and just how toxic Manson truly is. You think you're gonna get married and you're gonna have a happy family and you're gonna live? Stop! Sit down! Stop! Shut up and sit down! The footage that you just watched is from what is referred to as the Lost Manson Home film. It was recorded in 1996 on Marlon Manson's Dead to the World tour while supporting his album Antichrist Superstar. During this time, Manson recorded a homemade video that starred Manson and an unidentified girl. The girl was tortured and forced to engage in violent sex acts. The only known footage to exist to the public are a few seconds in the Dead to the World VHS tape released in 1998. The whole video is speculated to be in the hands of Manson's lawyers. Manson's lawyers and Manson himself are the only two people who have seen the video in full. It was supposed to be a form of art but the few people who saw it urged Manson not to release it as it may end his career or send him to jail. I tried to do some further research about this video but a lot of it is speculative obviously because nobody truly knows what happened but some people have said in several posts and forums that I've read that apparently this girl was made to drink the band members urine and had several acts inflicted upon her that were very very disturbing and um, if you want to do your own research just look up the lost Manson tape and see what you can find I mean a lot of it is speculation like I said but it is very very disturbing and either way the video itself is harrowing enough to even see let alone speculate about. This next video is a fan video that I came across on YouTube from a girl who's about 16 I think. She was 15 at the time when she met Manson and here she is describing her meet and greet experience with him where he makes sexual comments towards her and alludes to some very disgusting things and I just feel like what's the most disturbing about this is that this girl is delighted with herself like she is so happy that this experience happened and you know she's like bragging about it basically and that's the worst part about these kind of things is that when these young girls hear these things from their idols they see it as like oh my god I'm attractive to him wow like I can't believe this but what they don't see is that there is a man who is insanely older than them who should know better saying these things to underage girls it is so ridiculously disturbing to me my experience meeting Marilyn Manson some of you might already know what happened but I think it's pretty cool what what happened between me and him and I was like the youngest person there I was like oh my god I'm the only teenager and it felt so awkward um so like we got to the signing and you had to put your bag down like before you went in there was like a curtain and he was sitting at a table and um you went in I had like all my stuff I had like so much stuff for him to sign because I was going to give most of it to my to people and I was and I walked behind the curtain he was there and I'm like oh my god that's him that that's him and I, I looked at him I'm just like and it was like the lady in front of me was like and I was like <laughs> it was terrifying <laughs> I was scared. I don't know why. I was so scared to meet him. And then, like, he looks behind me and he sees, like, the couple, they're, like, in their 30s. So he's like, are those your parents? I'm like, no. He's like, oh, so you came alone. And I'm like, yeah, he's like, oh. And I'm like, he's like, I do that when people come to my house and they're alone. I'm like, oh, that shovel? Yeah, that's just for gardening. And I was like, he's talking to me. <laughs> he's like, what's your, what's your name? And I'm like, Cassidy. He's like, oh, like, uh... Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, I'm like, yeah! And he's like, well, he didn't have cute braces like you, like, 
He thinks my braces are cute. And then, um, when we got back in line, um, uh, we went into the pictures and I go into the car and he looks at me, he's like, there you are, there she is, I'm like, hi. And then I go on the wrong side of the picture, he's like, come over here, and I'm like, went around and he puts his arm around me and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> and he's like, how old are you? I'm like, I'm 15. And he's like, well, 15 is my favorite number, but this is the best part to start. Call me when you're 18 so I can impregnate you. And I shit you not, he said that to me. Everyone thinks I'm lying, but I'm not. I swear I'm not. And I'm like, okay. He looks down. He's like, no, you don't want to do that. And I'm like, okay. We got done with the picture. My face in the picture is so bad because he said that to me. Because I was like, he said that to me. He likes me. He thinks I'm cute. Oh, my God. And he grabs. I was walking out. And I'm like, I didn't give him a hug. I didn't say thank you. I didn't say I love you. I didn't. I didn't. I, he grabs me and kisses my forehead right there, right there, right there. I'm going to narrate two fan stories that I found posted online. One was on an anonymous posting board and the second was on an Instagram story. My ex-girlfriend of 2008 was the most devoted and interested Manson fan I had ever met. I was 18 and she was 17. She traveled around the US following his shows and did whatever she could to get in. She befriended Manzin, Nick Kushner, Tony Silva, Rudy and so on, deeply ingraining herself in the circle. By 2009 she had her break and she got to be an extra in the Armageddon video. By 2010 she befriended Lainey Chantal on a high level, going as far as the two of them getting matching tattoos. Through the process by nature, she of course wound up very close with Lainey's future husband, Jordy. Through this friendship forge, she began to regularly attend all of the exclusive hour-long hangouts one would come to think of with being within Manson's inner circle. By 2015, after Manson partially or permanently split with whoever he was seeing at the time, she was introduced in a romantic manner by Jordy and Lainey. This was finally her coming full circle. What ensued was a three-month ordeal of her and Manson having sexual relationship and her spending a lot of time in his new Spanish-style property in LA. This ordeal came to a climax by her having to call Laning and Jordy to pick her up from Manson's house to get her away from him after a night of drinking rituals devolved into Manson getting blackout drunk and abusing her in aggressive, verbal and physical manner. Trying to bind her hands, telling her he could bury her in his garden, accosting her for not knowing what it's like to have a parent die, insulting her, making violent euphemisms for things that he could do to her and eventually, in the midst of a long night of alcohol and cocaine use, coaxed her into cutting her on her thigh with a razor blade as marks of affection. Manson is a competent, warped individual and is only really good for music, but now today is a sad, pathetic sight. Needless to say, the romantic fling never continued and to this day she harbours deep regret for ever having been a fan and ever having any of his symbols tattooed on her body. What's a nobody going to do about telling the world that a notorious rock star mistreated them in a sick and abusive way? Get the world to believe them? Another fan by the name of Louise Key Bell posted on her Instagram, Hashtag, I am not okay because my first sexual experience at the age of 19 was being drunkenly coerced into taking my top off by a man in his 40s on a tour bus so that he could judge which fan had the best body. Then he stuck his hands into my underwear without my consent, and at the time, I thought I was lucky. I've always struggled with insecurity about my body, so he made me feel special for being chosen. I idolized him. I was the quietest girl there, and he focused on me and poured more vodka. I wish I could go back in time and stand up to him, also his horrible girlfriend at the time who joined in. We met again three years after the incident and he swept me away with kind words, promises and a romantic fantasy he built. I thought he was a good person and the past incident was a mistake. He paid my travel expenses to come on tour. It was never real love. The times I hung out on his bus, he got his assistant to pick out pretty girls from the show. He joked about rape and roofy drinks and we nervously laughed. I felt sick and dizzy from just one or two of these drinks. Now I wonder if it ever really was a joke. I am not okay that he painfully grabbed my wrists in bed and told me to look into his eyes. When I looked away and struggled, he gripped tighter. He left bruises. I am not okay with how he treated me and pretended things never happened. The times I tried to talk about it. 
I only ever ask for an apology. I am not okay with being made to feel crazy and blaming myself. I am not okay that this type of behavior is normalized in the music industry. In this next clip, you can see the singer Taylor Momsen singing a duet with Marlon Manson at the Revolver Golden Gods Awards in 2012. The two here are seen singing Dope Show together. And you can see here that it is a sexual performance. The two are kind of playing off each other, but then it goes really wrong. And you can see Manson starts to kind of choke Taylor Momsen with his arm around her neck. And he's really, really doing it hard. And you can see she's trying to get away. She's trying to like do all these different moves in order for him to like not be grabbing her anymore. But he keeps going back. He tries to push her head into his crotch. And she's trying to do her thing. She's trying to kind of, you know, move about. But he's still forcing her into this position and kind of coaxing her in a way. And it's very, very uncomfortable to watch. Thanks to the Manson is Abusive page on Instagram, I came across a video of a woman who actually was one of the assistants helping Taylor Momsen prepare for her gig that night. And she details the aftermath of this situation. Take her to walk her to the stage. Um, I was also responsible with like anything that she wanted in the dressing room. And I helped her like get whatever she wanted in the dressing room, food, water, tea, all that stuff. Um, and then I was to escort her from the dressing room backstage to her performance. And she was scheduled to perform with Marilyn Manson. We escorted her to the stage and right after the performance with Marilyn Manson, she was supposed to go to the biggest interview of the night, which was the interview with the company that was hosting the event. Um, so that was like the main thing that she had to do that night aside from the performance. So her manager and her friend were watching the performance from the side of the stage. They were backstage watching, or they were side stage watching the stage. I was going back and forth between watching at side stage and then they had a TV projection in the backstage area. She came off stage and I was like, okay, we got to go to the interview. She came off stage extremely frantic and there was like, she was, she was a mess. Well, she wasn't a mess, but she was like frantic. She didn't know what was going on and she just kept saying like crazy things. And then she also had blood like running from her mouth. She was bleeding out of her mouth. So she would, the things that she was saying when she came off stage was things like, we didn't plan that in rehearsal. We did not do that in dress rehearsal. What the, like, what, he's crazy. We did not go over that. And um, she was like, he choked me. He choked me. He choked me. And yeah, so she was pretty distraught. Um, I quickly got her some water. And obviously the big interview of the night was not going to happen. So, um it took a while for her to calm down and just process what had just happened and she ended up getting choked on stage by Marilyn Manson and they obviously did not discuss that like during dress rehearsal. If you have made it this far in the video I want to thank you so much for watching. It has taken me a long time to compile this information Believe me, there is so much more out there than you could ever imagine. There are so many stories people are sharing. I've had women contact me privately to tell me their story about how they have experienced Manson's abusive behavior. And I really genuinely appreciate that people can confide in me in that way. And I really hope that by posting this video that I am contributing in some way to the justice that these women and these people deserve. Because Manson should not get away with this. He is so brazen and speaks so openly about his abusive behaviors and tendencies. And I feel like if someone tells you who they are, you should listen. I would like to give a shout out to the Manson is Abusive Instagram page, which was a really big source of information for me. It led me down many rabbit holes and it is constantly being updated and it is very, very informative. If you do want to keep up with this situation, I highly recommend following. 
I want to say that I was a fan of Manson and his music for many, many years, so it's very sad for me to find this out about somebody who I actually genuinely enjoyed and looked up to as an artist at one point. But, you know, the term don't worship false idols really comes into play right here and right now. And it's a hard lesson to learn and it's horrible to see people that you admired and realize that they're not what you thought they were. But unfortunately, this is the reality of the situation and this man is constantly telling us what he has done and we're not listening and I really think it's about time we listened. I will leave some links and information down below if you guys want to find more information on Manson and his behavior. I'll leave a link down below to my first video if you want a deep look into his relationship with Evan Rachel Wood. And I really hope that the women who have been abused by Manson will find some sort of solace and justice for what has happened to them because it is just truly, truly terrible. Until next time, guys, stay safe and take care of yourselves.